Welcome to the Membership Guys podcast. Kick-ass advice and tips for membership site owners. Well, hello there. Welcome to episode 105 of the Membership Guys podcast. I'm your host, Mike Morrison, and this is the show where we dispense proven practical tips and advice for growing a successful membership website. Today, I'm chatting to a very special guest, Mr. Jeff Goins. Now, Jeff is a best-selling author, and he also teaches thousands of other authors how to create and write their book, how to build a business around their publications and so on through his very popular course, Tribe Writers. He also runs an annual conference. He blogs, he podcasts, he does all that good stuff. And I've been aware of Jeff for quite a while, but in all honesty, I associate him with writing. And even though I've published two books the most recent of which, Member Machine, is available on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, and wherever books are found. (laughs) But despite the fact that I've written two books, I've never really considered myself a writer. And the format of the books that I've written hasn't necessarily been particularly creative. They're more instructional, they're very much chunked down content. The first book was 101 Top Tips on Marketing Your Business on a Budget. The most recent one is a 30-day step-by-step guide through creating and launching a membership site. And while, of course, I'm very proud of the books, I've had amazing feedback, I love the end result, they're not particularly creative. I didn't feel that they really made me have to flex my writing muscle. I didn't necessarily need to be a writer to create them. And because of that, I've never really dug as deep into Jeff's stuff as I wanted to simply because I thought he is a guy who talks so much great stuff about writing, but I'm not a writer. Until I met Jeff for the first time at Tropical Think Tank, which is a fantastic event that was hosted by Chris Ducker every year in the Philippines, where I had the honor and the privilege of sharing the stage with Jeff. And when I heard Jeff speaking not just about writing, but around the business side of it and how he's managed to take his work as a launch pad or a catapult for selling digital products. That massively intrigued me and straight away got me thinking about how great it would be to have Jeff on the show. Now, it just so happens between meeting Jeff over in the Philippines a few months ago and the recording of this interview, Jeff's released a brand new book by the name of Real Artists Don't Starve. And this is very much shattering this myth, this idea that you have to be a starving artist artists that artists are not artists unless they starve for their art the idea of commercializing or making money from anything that involves your creativity almost being frowned upon or you know that typical if you're an artist or if you're creative everybody telling you that you should get a real job so jeff pretty much takes this entire thing apart and smashes it to pieces so as well as talking about the business side of how you can monetize your creativity. I really want to dive into that with Jeff because I know a lot of our listeners, a lot of people in our community, you're artists, you're creating creative works. And we see people struggling with the mindset around that and struggling with the principle of actually profiting and building a business around your creativity. Not just that, but also people who don't necessarily consider what they do to be creative. Jeff's got something to say about that. So this is a fascinating interview. Really, really was. It's an area that Jeff has clearly dedicated so much time and energy and passion to really researching and really getting into. And it makes for a brilliant interview that I thoroughly enjoyed and I'm sure you're going to get a huge amount of value from. Before we get to my conversation with Jeff, I want to take this opportunity to remind you that the Membership Guys podcast is brought to you by membersiteacademy.com, the largest and leading online training community for membership site owners. Whether you are currently planning out your membership and trying to figure it all out, whether you're building it and wrestling with the technology, prepping for your launch, or even if you've got your membership site up 
and running and you're trying to find ways to grow it, to bring new members, to hold on to them, membersiteacademy.com has everything you need for a successful membership website. We've got a course library consisting of practical, in-depth training courses and workshops that will help you at any stage of your membership. We have our patented membership roadmap that will take you step by step through the entire journey of growing and running a successful membership, plus member-only perks, discounts, offers, and a thriving, active, supportive community in which you obviously get access to Callie and myself day in, day out to ask us questions, get feedback, get all the support that you need as you grow a successful membership business. Head on over to membersiteacademy.com if you're not already a member. Check it out and I look forward to seeing you in there. And now, without any further ado, let's jump right into my conversation with Jeff Goins. Okay, my guest today is a best-selling author of titles such as The Art of Work and You Are a Writer. He's a popular blogger, speaker, creator of the Tribe Writers Course and host of the annual Tribe Conference. And he's recently released his fifth bestseller, The Fantastic Real Artists Don't Starve. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the Membership Guys podcast, Mr. Jeff Goins. Mike, thanks for having me. Those are nice things to say. I appreciate it. You are more than welcome. Now, of course, Jeff, we first met over in the Philippines at Tropical Think Tank, uh, yeah. Chris Ducker's incredible event. Um, yeah. I've just about recovered from the the climate, the, the <laughs> alcohol and the karaoke uh, experience, even just as an observer. <laughs> um, now, awesome. I, I knew when um, when... I heard you talk about not only your story in terms of becoming a, a, a writer and building a business around that, but more specifically how you have used your your books to launch digital products and to grow your business. And that's something I'd like to right. dive into a, a little bit okay. further into this. But before we get into that, I really want to ask you about your latest book, Real Artists okay. Don't Starve, in which you pretty much obliterate this idea, this whole myth of the starving artist. Where did that whole concept, that whole idea come from anyway? And, and why do you feel it's now the right time to be addressing it? Yeah, great question. I love that. Um, so I grew up uh, creative. You know, I grew up wanting to do creative things. And um, I was, uh, I used to draw cartoons when I was a kid. Uh, in high school, I was. Uh, really into acting in college, I got into directing and debate, public speaking. Uh, I, was, I was always into music. After um, uh, college, I joined a band for a year and traveled North America and had a little tour in Taiwan. We were huge in Taiwan, uh, which is <laughs> <I> love that. <laughs> it's, fun to say. It's, it's, it's great to say as well because nobody's ever going to be able to disprove that. Like even if you're, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think just slipping that in wherever you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, and so I was always creative, and I was often told this thing, even when I was touring as a full-time musician, hey, this is great to do while you're young, but there's no way that you can make a career out of this. Like one day you'll have to grow up and be serious and make a living because you can't make money off of art. You don't want to starve. And this was just this thing that I heard over and over again, almost like it was a cliche. And so, of course, I believed it. And so, you know, I went and got a job and seven years into working this day job, I realized what I really wanted to be doing was writing. And I did not think it was possible to make a full-time living writing. And eventually, you know, thanks to the internet and, and just the amazing opportunities that exist today, I started blogging. I was able to build an audience. I monetized that through digital products like eBooks and such, uh, and eventually an online course and some other things. Um, and, you know, uh, two years into this journey, about 18 months into this journey, I've replaced my income, my wife's income, we then tripled our household income. And, you know, I was sort of living this dream that I didn't even think was possible. And um, for years, I had this sort of survivor's guilt about this experience where basically I thought, you know, I got lucky or, you know, it was just kind of a one in a million thing. And mm -hmm. that this 
experience wasn't necessarily replicable. It was just a question that I had lingering in the back of my mind because people would say things like, oh, you got lucky or that was your big break or whatever. And yeah. anytime I think somebody says that about, you know, really hard work that you've done, you get a little bit defensive. <laughs> but the truth, the truth, Mike, was I, I didn't know. Like I wasn't sure if I had gotten lucky or not. And so that always bugged me. And over the years, I've met basically two groups of people. Uh, starving artists and what I call thriving artists, basically creatives in all fields uh, who are either making a living off of their art, which I define as just your creative gift shared with the world, um, and, and people who aren't, people who are are starving and struggling. And I have, uh, without fail, uh, observed that there are two very different mindsets between these two groups of people. And so what kicked off Real Artists Don't Starve for me was, first, this experience that I had. Uh, Second, this ongoing observation of what it takes to succeed in a creative field today and and realizing that it certainly begins with mindset. But what really kind of set me on this journey where I said, I have to write this book, was when I read an article about the artist Michelangelo and how – uh, he, when he died, had $50 million to his name, and he was the richest artist of the Renaissance. And all of a sudden, I, I was struck with this question. If the greatest artist of the Renaissance, arguably, uh, was also the richest, what does this mean for us today? Could it mean that you don't have to sell out to make money off of your creative work? And could it also mean uh, that you don't have to starve to create your best work. Cause here's a guy who's creating incredible work mm. and at the same time is making lots and lots of money off of this. He was paid a million dollars to paint the Sistine Chapel. Wow. Um, he was making 10 times, uh, what his contemporaries were making. And we can go into, you know, what that was, but I was just fascinated with it. I said, what does this mean for us today? And th- thus began basically a, a research project where I looked at 500 years of history from uh, authors and artists and creative entrepreneurs. And I asked the question, what are the things that creative people have always done to succeed? Because I wanted to illustrate timeless strategies, not like really cool faddish things that work now, but won't in six months. Uh, So what are the things that have always worked? But then, you know, what are the things that are still working today? And how can we capitalize on the internet and the opportunities that exist for us today to do the kind of work that we love and not have to starve for it. And that's how we got this book. Wow. That's amazing. And yeah, conveniently, they always, you, you know, it always seems to be missed out of anything that you see or hear about Michelangelo. The fact that actually he's mega successful. Like that's, that's amazing. And I know when I was reading, um, I know you, you, come back to Michelangelo a few times within the the book and it it kind of does knock you for six a bit because I think that whole starving artist is is worn as a a bit of a badge of honor in the same way that the hustling entrepreneur you can't be an entrepreneur unless you are ravaging your life by working 18 hour long days you can't be an artist unless you're on the bread line and and not making any money. And it's crazy where this uh, these sort of mindsets come from. Yeah, I, I think so. I think there is a badge of honor with with starving. And it really comes from this myth of the starving artist, which happens after Michelangelo. So mm. what Michelangelo does, according to uh, art historian and my, Michelangelo biographer Bill Wallace, uh, uh, he told me that he basically breaks the glass ceiling. He changes what is possible for artists to achieve and sets a new precedent of what he calls an aristocratic artist, uh, You know, basically a, a wealthy uh artist who is well known in society as somebody you know of 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 social high standing and there are many artists who come after Michelangelo during the renaissance who become wealthy because of this example but then in like the mid 19th century uh there's this guy named Henri Merger who writes a story uh, that eventually turns into La Boheme the opera uh Rent the musical even Moulin Rouge they all kind of come from this uh, a series of, of short stories that Henri Merger wrote uh, about the ideal, the bohemian ideal of the starving artist who's not making uh, art to make money but is making art for art's sake. Mm. And this story uh, has just 
continued for the past you know 150 or so years. And uh, I argue that it is no longer necessary, that it was never necessary. And you look at the Michelangelo story, which predates it, and it is not necessary for uh, artists, for creatives, for anyone to have to starve to create their best work. And as you also mentioned, you don't have to uh, work like a dog either to succeed. Uh, the, the goal of creating art, we all have art. We're all artists in the sense that uh, we have a gift that we need to share with the world. When I saw you talk about membership sites, which I was tired of hearing about, uh, when, when I saw you do this in the Philippines, I was like, this is Mike's art. Um, because you changed the way, and we talked about this, you changed the way I thought about it. And, and I, I was like, I have to do this. You know, you convinced me of doing something that I was so resistant to doing (laughs) because, because you changed the way that everybody was talking about it. You went from talking about recurring income, you know, free money, passive income to, Hey, this is the best way that you can serve your audience. And I go, wow, I'm, I'm in. So we all have art like that to share. And, um, the goal here is to thrive. Right. Walt Disney once said, um, we don't make films to make money. We make money so that we can make more films. So, look, I, I don't know about you, but my goal here isn't to become filthy rich. If that happens, cool. My goal is to wake up every day and get to do the kind of work that I want to do. It's not to retire. Uh, it's not to have a bunch of stuff, although stuff is great. I don't mind stuff. It's really to get up every day and have the freedom to do the work, the kind of stuff that I want to do to create the things that I feel called to create, that, yeah. that, that this is part of why I'm here. This is my purpose. And if I'm doing that, I'm thriving. Love that. And I'm right there with you on that. And, you know, we see this ourselves in, in our community where we have very creative, artistic uh, people in more traditionally artistic or creative fields trying to create a membership around what they do but you still get this sense of resistance from those guys when it comes to monetizing their creativity almost as though they they constantly have this voice in their head telling them that they're selling out or or maybe they're even just over protective or precious about their their craft we see a lot of things where you know the objection is well i can't really do that because what i'm creating is art what can these guys who are who have this so ingrained in them what can they do to shake that mindset? I think one of the things you can do is you can actually look at your heroes. Look at the people that came before you um, and and really understand where these people came from. So one of the reasons I wrote Real Artists Don't Starve and used a title like that that obviously is kind of picking a fight with the starving artist mentality is because, one, I wanted to point out that many of history's greatest artists and creative minds that we think – struggle to create their best work, they starved for the sake of their art, didn't. Yeah. Michelangelo, as I mentioned, obviously was rich. Uh, Picasso uh, was very rich. He had half a billion dollars uh, in net worth. Um, and Picasso once said this. I think this is, is really telling about um, that mindset that you're talking about. Picasso said, uh, I'd like to live like a pauper but with plenty of money. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's – I mean I think that's ultimately what we want is like I don't want to be one of those rich snobs, but I don't want to be lacking the financial means to create the kind of life that I, I want to live. Yeah. Um, so because I had a bunch of money, uh, Vincent van Gogh, who is held up as the paragon of artistic poverty and suffering, um, did not starve. His yeah. brother bankrolled him. His brother Theo was uh, a wealthy – art dealer and and he was his patron and for 10 years which was the uh spans of um uh van gogh's artistic career uh theo paid his bills and uh he actually did sell some of his paintings and um he you can read about this um he uh he made more than the guy delivering his mail like he was doing just fine was he rich no but he was making a living creating his art and You know, art costs money to make. So first of all, uh, you have to find a way to just pay for your expenses. I was talking to a writer the other day who's getting into blogging, wants to do this thing that we talk about a lot, wants to monetize his platform and uh, become a full-time writer. 
And, and he's, and he says, when do you spend money versus when do you you know try to make money? Like, you, you know, you've heard that thing. You've got to spend money to make money. Mm. And I said, I think your first job as a creative entrepreneur, which is what you are when you decide to monetize your art is to find a way to pay for your expenses. Right. That was my first goal as a, as a blogger was to just go crap. You know, I've got 10,000 email subscribers on MailChimp. That's costing me over a hundred bucks a month. <laughs> That's an expensive hobby. Like I don't, I don't spend that on bowling, you know? Uh, and I wasn't making much money at the time. So that was, I think that's the first goal is to find a way to pay for the art supplies, the computer, the hosting so that you can keep doing it without it, um, uh, you know, draining your bank account. And then from there, I think you realize that there are certain things that certain people won't value until they pay for them. Yeah. And, I, I was very, very resistant to charge for my art, my writing. And so for the first year, uh, I wrote a blog post a day for my blog, goingswriter.com. And uh, I wrote every single day just because I was trying to get a bunch of reps in. I remember asking Seth Godin one time when I got to know him, uh, why uh, do you still blog every day? Like, Because that's, that's, that's old hat. Seth, like you need to be writing mega posts, you know, that are optimized for SEO. And he says, I don't, I've been doing this for 20 years. She goes, I don't do it for any of that. I do it for the practice. I have to show up every day so that I know that I'm not hiding. And that really struck me. And so when I started blogging, I was doing it for the practice. I wasn't doing it for the attention or the audience. I kind of understood that if you did this long enough and you did it well enough, people would eventually notice but I was doing it every day because I just wanted to practice. And and I call this practicing in public. And I think this is a great way to get your art out into the world, a great way to market your work without feeling sleazy and self-promotional. Just keep showing up and demonstrating uh, what you're doing. Uh, you guys do this with the membership guys yeah. where you're basically taking stuff from – uh, from your membership site, sharing case studies, doing, you know, podcasts and you're, and you're, and you're sharing, you're kind of repurposing that content, sharing on your blog, sharing on your podcast, sharing it on social media. And like, that's the best marketing for the work, but you're not going like sign up, sign up, sign up, sign up, sign up. Yeah. You're just demonstrating uh, the effectiveness of what you're doing. And over time, people start to notice that and, and it becomes very irresistible. Uh, anyway, so that's what I was doing uh, without necessarily fully realizing it. I was doing that with my blog. And by the end of the year, uh, as I mentioned, I had about 10,000 email subscribers um, and I was, and it was costing me money. So I was like, okay, I have to find a way to make money. But the other strange thing that was happening, Mike, was about once a day, uh, I would get an email from somebody who was receiving my email newsletter and they would say, can I buy something from you? Like, I mean, this is happening every day. Like, hey, like, because I was giving away free eBooks. I was doing free webinars, free, 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 free. And because um, I was scared. I was just scared to ask for money. I didn't have um, any sort of entrepreneurship background. I was working as a marketing director for a nonprofit. Like, you know, I was fundraising my own salary. It was the antithesis of, um, <laughs> you know, entrepreneurship. <laughs> like, I didn't know how to make money. And and yet I kept getting emails from people who were seeing me practice in public saying, can I buy something from you? Because it was this sense of, I think, reciprocity. Hmm. And and so I do think that there comes a point where you realize, if I'm going to go to the next level, if I'm going to take my work more seriously, I'm going to have to start charging for some of it. And I was talking to a, a consultant yesterday who said that they um, – uh, you know, do coaching for uh, podcasters, and um, they were really, really nervous about charging more for their rates. They wanted to raise their rates. Wanted, they wanted to make more money. They're really nervous about that. And and this person had like a twenty percent conversion rate, getting people to sign up for um, coaching, uh, you know, for podcasting. So every ten people that he emailed or contacted, he would get you know two of them to sign up for um, some coaching spots. And so he decided, okay, I'm going to raise my rates, and he and he increased his rates significantly to the point that he was scared that nobody would sign up, and his conversion rate from rate went from twenty percent to eighty percent. <laughs> you know this, I mean, yeah. like this, this is like, but it still feels counterintuitive. Yeah. The idea that like there are certain customers and clients and fans of yours who will not even begin to take you seriously until you start charging 
not just money, but a certain amount of money. And so in, in, in the book, I say, um, before you expect the world to take you seriously, you've got to take yourself seriously. And that, and one of the ways that you do that is by setting a precedent that your work is worth something. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm sure that's something, that situation of being almost fearful of losing all of your audience if if you you happen to want to sell something to them or have a product or or service you want to sell i'm sure that's something that a lot of our listeners will resonate with and for sure it's something we see crop up in our communities um about you know people just being scared to take their membership to market we actually literally just come off a facebook live about uh, an hour ago and one of the the attendees on that was kind of saying i've just spent all this time developing and building this great site i'm terrified to actually go out there and market it and i think it's the same sort of thing kicking in there and you know what i love about everything we're talking about here and about the sort of principles that you really have a home in real artists don't starve is this isn't just anecdotal stuff. It's not just stories or case studies. This is stuff you're doing yourself in your business. And it's it's stuff you've helped other people to do as well with your, your students through Tribe Course. You don't just write a book, publish it, and then wait for the goodwill to flood in and hope that your, your bank might accept smiles and positive Amazon reviews <laughs> <laughs> as right. mortgage payments. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're, uh-huh. you, you're using your books to sell digital products, courses, your live event. Can Switching to that a little bit, can you share a little bit more about how you've, you've done that from a tactical point of view and your own specific approach to monetizing your work? Yeah, so um, uh, over the past few years, I've gotten more adamant about the, the quality side of things. Um, uh, you know, I used to think, I, I used to just sort of begin this conversation with the expectation that you know we all kind of understand that that quality is a prerequisite. I realize that that's like not everybody has the same definition of that. Yeah. So I want to be clear: like you, you've got to achieve some level of personal mastery in a field before you expect somebody to just pay you for it. Uh, and so. You know, I think that's that's really important, something we don't talk about enough. I mean, I remember seeing an ad recently where it was like, how to start your own online course in seven days and start making money, even if you're not an expert. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, so like, it's like, you might as well say how to sell air. Yeah. And I think we have to be really careful here. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And I don't, I don't say this to scare or shame any, anybody. I lead a, a membership site with thousands of writers who are the best at talking themselves out of being successful. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm constantly playing the role of encourager and saying, Hey, like, your your work has value. Let's you know find a way to help you thrive. Um, but like I think because this is easier than it's ever been, because it's cheaper than it's ever been. I mean, uh, my dad uh, moved across the country to start a restaurant in uh, Alabama, um, which was a had a much lower cost of living than Chicago, where uh, we grew up. And, and he, and he started a a business, but it still cost him like $10,000 to just get the business started, right? Buying all the equipment, doing all this stuff. It costs what? $5, (laughs) you know, to like get a self-hosted blog and then that, that you can, you can get a free theme and you're up and running and get a free PayPal account. Like the, the cost to start this thing is, is cheap. Uh, so the, the danger there is anybody can do it. So practically everybody will. And, and so we still want to be asking ourselves the question, what is it that I have to offer that's actually valuable to other people? And so I think it begins, and, and what I teach my students is um, the way that you monetize your work might surprise you. It'll probably surprise you. Um, and and the reason for that is, is uh, based on what Derek Siver says when he says, what's obvious to you is amazing to others. And I learned as a writer – First of all, I just had this vague vision that I wanted to be a writer. And so I started writing. I started blogging. And I, sh- I was writing about all kinds of different things, leadership, marketing, entrepreneurship, all these different things. And really what I was doing was I was copying my heroes. I was trying to be like Michael Hyatt or Seth Godin or Stephen Pressfield. And and this is actually a necessary part, I think, to finding your creative voice is to try on other people's voices. And over time, you kind of 
pick from all of these different places and then assemble it into this hodgepodge that look that looks original, but you know is really just a bunch of uh, your influences all kind of mushed together, um, which is all creativity is, by the way. And um, you know that should take the pressure off of you to go, well, I've got to make something new. No, you just have to reassemble a bunch of old things. Um, as Will Durant, the historian, says, nothing is new except arrangement. So we just want to rearrange our influences. Uh, anyway, so for me um, – what I realized I was doing that was uh, uh, obvious to me but amazing to others is uh, I was helping people become better writers. And I was doing this in the marketing position that I was in where every Monday morning I was teaching a principle about copywriting, um, uh, you know, how to tell a good story, uh, even like writing subject lines for emails. I was taking all these things that I would learned as a marketer for the past six and a half years and I was sharing them with my team of writers – uh, and saying, here's how to, here's how to go do your jobs. And every Monday morning I would do this. And so pretty soon I just started sharing that on my blog. And like I said, I was blogging every day, but every time I wrote about the craft of writing, I was getting, you know, five to 10 times the response that I was getting from my, um, other blog posts. And it wasn't like, I didn't have a huge audience, but instead of getting one comment, I might get five or 10. Right. Uh, and, and I was like, wow, there's something here. And so I think, uh, monetizing your work online really does begin with finding some unique value that you offer. And, and this requires a bunch of trial and error, a bunch of like throwing things against the wall to see what resonates. And I think, I don't know what you think about this, Mike, but I think a lot of people get into trouble, particularly creatives, uh, when they think this is the thing that I do and you better pay me for it. Yeah. Yeah. And and when you're so stubborn about that, um, it's probably not going to work out. Jeff Bezos says we are stubborn on vision but flexible on details. And so um, I think that's the place that you start at least. Yeah, I completely agree. I think so many people get so focused on the, the process as being what they do as opposed to the actual results and the change and the transformation that they're affecting uh, with people. Um, and yeah, that, that so often leads people down the wrong path, especially with membership sites in particular. We see that so much where typically what they set out trying to provide is just transformed into something completely different six months down the line because it's not actually what their audience want or what their members want. Um, this is all just such great stuff for anyone i suppose in a in a creative field if they identify as being creative but also people who maybe don't necessarily think of what they do as being creative but actually what you what you said about um uh, about listening to to my talk in the philippines of that in and of itself being its own self-contained art and everything each person does what you deliver that is that's your art i think there's so many crucial important things that people can can get just from our conversation but also from from your book too before we wrap up what would you say thinking along those lines what would you say would be the three main takeaways you'd like anyone listening to this whether they're in an explicitly creative field or in something they don't necessarily think is creative what would you want them to take away if they're struggling right now yeah so you're asking about kind of nuts and bolts and you know taking creative work and sort of t turning it into um, a business. And I, I want to make sure that I don't dodge that. So I think it's a great way to sort of wrap up three things. Very simple. Um, one start. I, I mean, I know that this is like, well, duh, uh, but so many people are not doing this. I, I, I was doing a Facebook live yesterday and, and I got, I got this question, which I thought was very interesting, but they said, what advice would you have for somebody who's writing a letter to their family to try to get a trust fund so that they can go be a full-time musician? Cause spending an hour a day is just not enough for me. And I was like, uh, well, I have no experience like writing petition letters <laughs> to get a trust fund, you know, have no trust fund myself, uh, not my world. Uh, if you can get a trust fund to fund your artistic career. Yeah, cool. Like, go for it. I'm not going to say don't do that. That <laughs> sounds great. Um, but what I would say before you do that is start small. Use that hour. Realize that um, there are plenty of people who have done what you want to do with less than an hour of free time a day. And and so don't disparage small beginnings. And so um, I, 
I talk to so many people, writers, creatives, even entrepreneurs, they're waiting for their big break instead of using the tiny little small opportunities that they have every day to just move forward a little bit. I call this the art of the small bet. Uh, it, it's a risk, but really the way that success, success happens is through a series of small bets over time, taking baby steps that gradually uh, build a bridge uh, in the direction of your dreams uh, versus you know, the overnight success, taking a leap. And, and there's some really interesting data about this. I read a study by the University of Wisconsin where they followed um, uh, over 5,000 American entrepreneurs for 15 years. And, and they basically kind of did the split test where they looked at half of the entrepreneurs were people who quit their jobs and then started a business, kind of like the traditional – um, you know, success story of entrepreneurship, yeah. right? I quit, I figured it out, I bootstrapped it and, you know, built it in this billion dollar enterprise. The other group of people were people who didn't immediately quit their jobs, but built their dreams on the side and then eventually kind of transitioned into full-time entrepreneurship. Well, it turns out the people who, um, uh, quit their jobs and then, um, uh, built a business, the risk takers were twice as likely to fail. Wow. Two times the amount of people that, that failed in that field, um, you know, like they, they basically underperformed the people who built a bridge, took their time. And so just from like a statistical standpoint, like it's better to do this thing slowly. And it doesn't have to be forever. Like it took me about two years, like starting the blog, building the business, getting enough cash in the bank that I felt like I'd really have to screw a lot up for this to not work. <laughs> And then, and then giving my notice at work and yeah. leaving. And the benefit to that is you never have to look back, right? Like I know so many people who become full-time entrepreneurs uh, and then six months later, they're back at a day job because they just didn't, they weren't in it for the long haul. So the, the first sort of step is to start, start small, find a way to uh, do your work every single day. Just do something small. Like right now, my day job is, um, you know, running an, uh, an online business, blogging, doing all these things that I have to do to maintain the, the business that I'm doing. Uh, and then I've got this book that I'm sort of promoting on the side and it, you know, it kind of fuels and, and, and feeds into the business, but they are separate entities. And, uh, I'm really trying to grow, you know, the thought leader author side of my brand more cause it's, it's probably the next, you know, 25 years of my life. Mm. So what I do every day is I spend about an hour thinking, what new podcast could I be on? Where else can I promote this? You know, what, what are just things that I can do every day to grow out this new part of my career? So we're all do, we're always doing that. We always have, I mean, I think as entrepreneurs, we're always thinking about like the, the next thing. <laughs> uh, and, and, and when you get this big block of time, I can speak from experience because I went from having a bunch of time working to having a bunch of free time to you know grow the business. When you get a big block of time just sort of dropped in your lap, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. You know, maybe yeah. more disciplined <laughs> people know, but, but you need to start small, teach yourself how to use whatever time that you have so that when you have more time, you will use it wisely. That's uh, wisely. That's thing one. Okay. So the Second thing that you want to do, the second step is find a way every day to practice in public. So on a podcast, on a Facebook page, on Instagram, uh, find some small way to share a piece of your work uh, with an audience so that when you have something to sell, people are actually going to care about it. Far too many people do this with uh, bootstrapping an app, with uh, building a membership site, uh, or even writing a book. Uh, they think that they can, they can go into a cave and create this thing for six months and then release it into the world. And people are actually going to care about this thing if they haven't done the work of building an audience. And it just – it doesn't work that way. Third thing, uh, last thing, is um, – Find a way to charge something. I, I, I mean I love Eric Ree's lean startup approach to this minimum viable product. So if, you've, if you're doing your work every day, right, 30 to 60 minutes, for me that means writing. Just showing up and trying to write 500 words, publishing that as a blog post or you know, spending the next five days editing that into you know, something that I could turn into a podcast or video. Whatever your craft is, you want to be – incrementally putting in reps every single day so that 
um, when it's time to practice in public, uh, you've got something to share. And for me, that, these days, that means writing a blog post once a week, doing a podcast once a week, um, and then you know using social media to just share. Like here's here's what I'm doing right now. Here's what I'm working on. Uh, sharing bits and pieces as I'm thinking through this stuff. And you're just kind of sharing uh, your process. Um, you know, practicing in public, uh, growing the audience, and then. Lastly, um, if you've done all that stuff, uh, what you want to do is begin a dialogue with that audience where you're finding out what what is it that you want. And as you mentioned, Mike, the thing that they want may not necessarily be the thing that you think they need. And so what you're trying to find is sort of the intersection between what you're passionate about. I think that's important, but that in and of itself is not necessarily enough to build a business. Uh, so you want to find the intersection of passion and skill and demand. What do you love that you're good at that people actually want? And when you answer those questions and you, you know, kind of draw a Venn diagram, because it's just things that I'm passionate about that people don't necessarily need or want for me. Like I'm really good at making guacamole, but you know, (laughs) like that's just a hobby and that's okay. Uh, and I'm good at it. (laughs) And then there are also things that I'm good at that people want for me that I'm just not super passionate about. And I know that over time that drains me. And so I'm really trying to, the things that, the way that I monetize what I do, um, I I want it to be the convergence of all those three things. And I think practically speaking, the best way to do that is once you get, you know, several hundred or, or, you know, hopefully like a thousand subscribers, people in your audience, um, it could be less than that, but it needs to be a, a good sized group of people. You could do a survey with them and just ask them what they're struggling with. And you do a really good job helping people with this, Mike. So I know this isn't necessarily new information, but those are three very practical things that you can do um, to uh, um, kind of set yourself on the track to uh, building a business. And I don't know what you found with this, Mike. I did that early on, right? I built a blog. I got a thousand email subscribers. I sent them a survey saying, what do you want? And they said, we want an ebook on how to, how to build a blog like you. I was like, cool, I'll do that. And I tried lots of different things that had failed, you know, to make money. And then I did this. And in a weekend I made $1,500, which was a paycheck for me. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll do this every month. But then from there, it kind of exponentially grew. And then I, I, I took that ebook down. I, I spent a few months making it better. Then I re-released it and I made about $20,000 in two months off of it. And then I turned it into a course. And by the end of the year, we'd made $150,000 off of these different income streams. And I was like, I could do this. This is, this is a thing. You know, I went from making $30,000 at a nonprofit to making, you know, 150 grand. And, and then there got this point where I stopped doing that, where I thought, I, I know what these people need. I'll just give it to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every, every time I do that, I fail. Even with like a book or a course or an idea, uh, when I go, no, 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 I don't like, look, I'm a big deal. Like, I don't need to ask people what they want anymore. <laughs> I know, you know, and the ego gets ahead of me. It always fails. And so these are not things that you do early on. Like these are things that you always do. You're always uh, doing your work. You're always practicing in public so that you're continuing to build your audience. And you should always be interacting with that audience to find out through that dialogue, what do they want from you right now? And how can you continue to help them by providing things that are obvious to you that are amazing to others? Love it. And I honestly, I'm going to implore our listeners, rewind back about 10 minutes, listen to that all over again, because that is solid gold stuff that is pretty much i would say at the root of any any time we see a membership that just doesn't take off or someone disappointed with their launch or you know things just haven't quite lined up it's because they they haven't done the things that we just talked about there they haven't actually validated people want what they're they're offering or they're selling the wrong thing or um you know they're they're just going into it completely the wrong way so hit rewind listen again and uh, yeah, we'll catch you in like five, 10 minutes. Jeff, this has been awesome. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Of course, if anyone listening is still a little uncomfortable, still feels like, yeah, but you know, I'm a real artist, get yourself a copy of Real Artists Don't Starve. It'll set you right. 
Jeff, thank you again so much. Where can our listeners go to connect with you? Mike, thanks for having me. I love what you're doing. I'm a big fan of you guys. Um, you can find out more about me at goingswriter.com. You can get a free guide on how to build an audience there. Uh, that's just my last name, goins, G-O-I-N-S, writer.com. Uh, you can learn more about the book there as well. And if you do pick up a copy of the book, be sure that you go to don'tstarve.com, don'tstarve.com to get a bunch of bonuses uh, that come free with the book as well. Awesome. I haven't picked up them bonuses yet, so I'm going to go and do that too. Jeff, uh, get them. <laughs> yeah, and we'll have all those links and all that good stuff on the show notes page as well. Jeff, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll catch up with you again soon. The pleasure is mine. Thanks, Mike. Thanks again to Jeff Goins for joining me for this episode. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. It was fascinating. At times, I had to kind of give myself a little nudge to remember that I was interviewing this guy because I was getting so enthralled, you know, as he was diving into some of the stories, particularly about Michelangelo and how so many perceptions of him and of famous artists in general are so out of line with that typical theory, that typical myth and idea of the starving artist. I hope you guys found it interesting and I genuinely feel the sort of stuff Jeff talked about there and the stuff that it goes into more depth with in Real Artists Don't Starve is essential, essential stuff for getting your mind right and for realigning and adjusting your approach to profiting from your skills, from your passions and from your creative work. So be sure to pick up a copy, Real Artists Don't Starve. It's available on Amazon and in all bookstores and all that good stuff. Thanks once more to Jeff. Hopefully you enjoyed our conversation. That's it for this week. I'll be back again next week with another installment of the Membership Guys podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the Membership Guys podcast, we invite you to check out the membersiteacademy.com. The Member Site Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing and running a membership website. So whether you're still figuring out what your idea is going to be or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Member Site Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discounts, perks and tools, and a supportive, active community to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement and advice, the Member Site Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow a successful membership website. So check it out at membersiteacademy.com.